Shepard and her team for this opportunity to talk to you all about burnout. Now, what is burnout and why does it occur? Burnout is a psychological and physiological phenomenon that occurs when you are overwhelmed, emotionally drained, and unable to keep up with life's incessant demands. Burnout is a form of exhaustion that results from feeling constantly swamped. In other words, burnout is the result of being too stressed for too long. This condition is not medically diagnosed. However, burnout can affect your physical health and your mental health if you do not acknowledge it and treat it. There is hope. Burnout is not permanent. Sometimes we experience burnout as we try to control things that are outside of our control. Instead, we should focus on those activities that are within our control. These activities that can help reduce burnout include exercise. Exercise at least 30 minutes a day, three times a week. Take your mental health days. Get enough sleep. For adults, we're talking between seven to eight hours per night. For children, between eight to 12 hours. Practice self-care. Do those things that actually rejuvenate you. Set boundaries, protect your peace, and honor your privacy. Recognize and pay attention to the signs of burnout. Burnout is not something that just happens overnight. Burnout is something that happens slowly over time. So you want to pay attention to yourself. What are you feeling? And why are you feeling some of these things? Some of the common symptoms of burnout include headaches, fatigue, stomach ache, intestinal issues, frequent illnesses, and changes to our sleeping habits and our eating habits. In many cases, we can think of burnout as it's only related to our jobs. However, we see burnout in other areas of our lives especially our social interactions. But let us not forget that God made the Sabbath for us. Sabbath rest is key in helping us to reduce our stress and burnout. Mental rest, physical rest, emotional rest, spiritual rest, resting in the fact that Jesus is in control. It is important for us to remember that we have hope. Lamentations 3, 22 through 24 tells us, that it is the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion. My soul saith my soul. Therefore, will I not hope in him? Burnout can be a part of life. It does not have to consume you. When we take time to think about what we are feeling, adjusting certain aspects of our lives when necessary, and continuing to remember God's mercies are new every morning, then you too can avoid burnout and recover quickly if burnout does occur. Thank you for your time. Have a blessed Sabbath. Good morning.
Hello, hello, West Wilmington SDA. My name is Dr. Juwanza McIntosh. I am a licensed clinical psychologist working at the uh, Howard University Counseling Service. And it is a pleasure to be speaking with you all, even though it's on video, it still counts. I just wanna give a thank you to specifically um, Dr. Uh, Samantha Burt. Thank you so much, me and Samantha go back to the beginning, pretty much from the very beginning. And so I am really thankful for this opportunity she uh, offered to me to speak to you all about some mental health topics. All right, so let's jump into it. So basically, I'm going to talk just for a few minutes today on anxiety. Now, why did I choose anxiety? It's a, it's a really good question. Part of the reasons why I chose it is because anxiety is one of the most overlooked and underestimated and dismissed mental health issues. What I mean by that is that anxiety is often seen as that one issue where it's like, okay, that person's just a little jittery, right? That person's just a, a bit of a worry ward. It's fine. That person's just a little paranoid here and there. And what happens is when we minimize it like that, we don't get a chance to offer support to those of us who might be dealing with that. And so here, we will get a chance to really dive into just, just, just a little bit of anxiety, um, what we call psychoeducation, education about psychological topics. So essentially, what anxiety actually is and what it looks like, what it feels like, is excessive worrying. Excessive worrying about almost always the future. It's almost always about the what if, is what we call it. What if this happens? What if that happens? What if I lose my job because I'm late? What if this traffic gets in my way? What if I'm homeless? Well, what if I get in a fight because I'm homeless? What if, what if, what if, what if? There's a thousand what ifs and it gets to the level where it freezes us. It stops us from acting. It stops us from talking to people. It stops us from being, uh, um, uh, speaking up at work, speaking up at church. It looks like um, being so anxious that if you're like a lot of anxious people, it really hits you when you're trying to get to sleep, right? You'll be laying down in bed and when you close your eyes, there's no more stimuli to distract us. And what happens is that the, the thoughts of the day, the things that you messed up on, the things you wish you hadn't have said, they all hit you at once. And it can keep you up if it's really bad. It can wake you up in the middle of the night if you have something to worry about. Anxiety can hit us in a lot of different ways. It can also have some physical manifestations, right? And so anxiety can often look like uh, fiddling with your hands when you're really nervous about something or if it's just a habit. Tapping your foot a whole lot, right? That's usually a sign of some anxiety. When you uh, have to grab something to, to fiddle with all the time, when you start to shake, right? Or start to feel so nervous that you begin to sweat at the thought of doing something. That's a sign of anxiety, right? And so there are a lot of different ways. And when it gets really bad, it can often even look like panic, right? We all have a sense of what panic is, right? Where we feel as if something bad is really going to happen. And so our heart is really beating fast. And we begin to um, have to react in certain ways to protect us from whatever we're afraid of. And when it, and when it escalates even more, you can have a panic attack. Panic attacks often have symptoms of, symptoms of uh, erratic heartbeat, right? Of sweating, of hyperventilating, feeling like you can't breathe, feeling like you're going to pass out, feeling like the world is closing in on you. They tend to last for the average person, maybe three to five minutes. For some, it's longer. And it's a super scary event, right? And so that is all a sign of anxiety that has grown to the point where your body has to do something about it immediately. That's what a panic attack is. Another sign of worrying, essentially. At its very core, it's worrying about almost always the future. Almost always about what's going to happen. It can be extremely scary. So, so those are some of the symptoms or what anxiety can actually look like on a day-to-day -day basis, all right? So then the next question is, what do we do about it? West Wilmington, what do we do about anxiety? Do we just sit with it? Do we dismiss 
granny of, as just being a worry wart? Or do we find a way to be active and intentional about managing these anxiety symptoms? So if we have just a few minutes, perhaps I can do a, a, a just a, one of my favorite ways to manage anxiety, a little bit of a coping technique with you all. All right. So one of the best ways to manage anxiety is to get out of the future, get out of worrying about the future and stay present, stay in the here and now, stay in the present where we're supposed to be. Right. If you guys are in your Bible, you'll know the Bible talks about leaving the worries for tomorrow till tomorrow. It, the Bible even talks about this idea of why do we worry about where our food and clothes are going to come from when the birds don't worry about that? Doesn't God care about us more than the birds? And so part of the one of the ways of staying present is to really um, find a way to make a list of the blessings that you have. Right. And if you're like most of us, that can be a long list. What are the blessings? What am I thankful for in this moment? That is a super helpful way. Make that list. A second way to stay present is to focus on our five senses. What do I mean? It's really cool when you think about it. Our senses tend to work only in the here and now. If you think about it, you can't see or hear anything in the future. You can guess what it looks like or what it sounds like. You can't taste or smell anything in the past. You can remember what it smelled like or what it tastes or, or what it uh, sounded like. But the reality is your senses, your five senses only work in the here and now. So let's practice real quick. All right. What I want you to do, everyone take a moment. We'll just do, just do a couple of them. First, we'll do sight. Sight's a really good sense, right? Take a moment. And focus in right here and say, all right, I'll give you guys a color, brown. Identify quietly to yourself five brown things around you. See if you can find five brown things. All right. Did we get it? We found our five? All right. Good, good. Now, I want you to do something even trickier. I want you to find something that has many multiples of it, at least like 10 of it, right? So that can be people around you. That can be pews, that can be letters on a poster, that can be designs or patterns on the ceiling or tiles or on the floor, that can be um, all kinds of things around you, right? Dresses, suits, whatever it is. Find at least 10 of those and count them out um, quietly to yourself. We don't want to disturb everybody. Count those quietly to yourself. All right, go for it. We got it? Good, good, good. All right, now I want you to take a moment and take a deep inhale through your nose and tell me what you smell. Prayerfully, everyone around you smells good, but tell me what you smell. At least tell yourself what it is that you smell. See if you can identify the actual scent, not just a thing, right? Don't tell me Irish spring. Tell me what the scent is. Good? All right, now I want you to take your hands. And I want you to touch something around you that's not you, right? Touch anything around you. Maybe it's a pew. Maybe it's a table. Maybe it's a purse. Maybe it's your tie. Something that's not actually you. And I want you to describe it to yourself in as many ways as you can without looking at it. So that's important. Don't look at it because that that's engaging a different sense, right? Tell me what it feels like, the texture, the shape. Describe it to yourself. The temperature, right? Describe it in as many ways as you can. All right, we good? Good, excellent, excellent. You guys are doing great. That's just a few. Now, what you might not notice for the last like minute and a half we've been doing this, you have been unable to think about anything else. If you've been locked in with us, your brain is completely focused on your senses. Because when we engage the senses, even if you don't smell anything or taste anything or see anything, when you engage it, when you use it, it forces your brain to stay in the here and now. That is a good, <clears throat> small little mini technique for managing anxiety. Other ways to manage anxiety, therapy. And let's, as a church body, move past this conversation of, is therapy for us? Do we even need it? Therapy is there for everyone. Now, I'm a big fan of prayer. I'm a huge fan of prayer. It's done a lot in my life. But 
it is presumptuous and a bit arrogant, if we're being honest, to assume that we know how God's going to answer our prayer. Perhaps it's miraculous. Or perhaps he's answering our prayer through a professional who's there to help us. Now, we are often really comfortable with that idea when it comes to our physical needs, right? If we, if we have physical ailments, if, if I start coughing up blood, or if my back hurts, I know to go to the doctor. You pray about it too, but sometimes the answer to that prayer can be through a professional. Let's be open to talking to someone. The Bible talks about the, the, the need for counselors all the time. Let's lean into that. Therapy is good. And if you go to a therapist, psychologist, they might be able to connect you with the, the next thing we're going to talk about, which is medication. A psychiatrist can prescribe some medication just to help moderate the anxiety if you feel like it's really bad, if you feel like it's really getting in your way privately or more so in a social context when you're around people. Tap in with your, with your therapist. Tap in with a psychiatrist. Get some medication if it's really bad for you. Otherwise, you can check out YouTube and get a bunch of techniques. Look up grounding techniques, right? Look up mindfulness techniques. Look up ways to, to manage anxiety and you will find them. Let's be intentional, all right? Let's be intentional, West Wilmington. So that is my time. I am super thankful for this little mental health minute, couple of minutes that was um, offered to me. And I'm um, hopefully this has been useful information. I pray that you all continue to be safe and that we continue to be mindful and intentional about our mental health. Thank you. Good morning, church family. Oh, y'all can do better than that. Good morning, church family. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. We thank God for allowing us to see another day, another Sabbath. Uh, some of us are not able to make it today, and uh, we know we're not uh, the most privileged persons to be here, but uh, with God, everything is possible, and we thank him for that. Um, how many of you are happy to be here this morning? Amen. Amen. I hope everyone had a wonderful night. I wish I could say the same. Uh, my baby girl was sick all night and I was up all night. But we thank God we're able to make it. Uh, my wife is home and uh, she's staying with the kids. Hopefully they're having a wonderful Sabbath as well. And just to start, we're going to uh, do a short prayer um, to start the service. Dear God, we thank you for allowing us to be here this morning. Thank you for your Sabbath day. As we're about to worship you, please take over this place and help uh, everyone to come out here with your blessings. Guide us, protect us. We pray you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> keeping in the same theme of, you know, mental health and um, just being holistically healthy. We chose some songs that we hope would be a blessing to you. And if you're going through something that we hope would give you some hope and reassurance. So our first will be a shelter in the time of storm.
blessed assurance that Jesus is ours and that we belong to him. So we're going to sing, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. And that's hymn number 462.
now is the time for the little children. Uh, we invite them to collect the offerings as we're going to have the children's story with uh, Brother Roger. We have all the friends. Oh, wow, we have all the friends. Come on up, bring those monies. Wow, wow, okay. We see that the, the grown-ups, uh, some of them uh, are putting George Washington's in there, and those are acceptable. They're not ideal, they're acceptable. Uh, but we do, see, we do see some Lincolns, and uh, we're looking for Franklins. Uh, because all of those funds that the children bring up are used to support Christian education here, and we know that we are very fortunate, very fortunate uh, to have a church community that has been so supportive of the, uh, our school uh, and Christian education, and each week that the children go around, your contributions make a very meaningful contribution. Uh, uh, they really meaningfully contribute uh, to making it affordable for those to attend school right here. How are you guys today? Everyone doing all right? Yeah. Who's not doing all right? Ha, okay. So, you know, adults, we're going to be talking about lots of other things today, and we're going to be talking about things like mental health, and like kids are like, I don't know what that is, but I'll tell you what. All right, what's this part of my body called? Head. It's my head? Great. Now, my head has lots of things on it, right? Right now, I mean, it has like things that I put on it, like these glasses, I've got this thing, but all of our heads share something in common. What are some of the things that we have on our head? What do we have? Hair. We have, oh yeah, hair. What else? Eyes. We have eyes. Man, does that help us do anything? What does it help us to do? What else do we have on our head? Mouth. A mouth? What does that help us to do? Oh, yes, what else? Do we have anything else on our head? What did you say? He said a brain, and I don't have a mic to mic him. But how do you know that? You can't see it, right? Then how do you know there's one there? I can see my eyes. You watched it on some videos. Okay, so, all right, help me, guys, because I can see my eyes. I know it's there. I can see my nose. I can hear, I can see my ears because I can touch them. I know my mouth is there. I, I, I can smell different things with my nose. So how do I know that I have a brain? Because I, I yes, I did watch some shows. How else? Who else? How do I know I have a brain? Oh man, I can think. Yeah, I can think everything. 
Oh, man. And so uh, let me tell you a quick little story about how powerful, how powerful our brains are. Uh, so what do brains usually do? Brains help us think. So it turns out that there are some different words that I can have in my brain that really help me and words that are really close that really don't help me. Let me give you an example. Uh, little boy, his name, well, his name actually was Michael, but his uh, parents got into the habit of calling him, instead of Michael, they called him, I can't. Uh, I can't. Yeah, his name was Michael, but his parents called him, I can't. Well, do you know why they called him that? Oh, man, because Michael, he, he had these thoughts in his brain. He was in the first grade. I should let you know. Do we have anyone in the first grade here? No, no first graders. Kindergarten? Preschool. I'm about to go kindergarten. Okay. Well, Michael uh, had work to do, like... They brought home spelling words, and mom and dad would say, it's time to do your spelling words. And Michael would look at the spelling words, and you know what he'd tell them? I can't. So his name was Michael, but they called him I can't. <laughs> Parents would say, hey, Michael, uh, we need you uh, to help uh, clean up the family room because there are a bunch of toys. And Michael would say, I can't. I can't. <laughs> uh, uh, sometimes Michael would get really upset when things didn't go his way. I know none of you do that, right? But he did. He got upset when things didn't go his way. And sometimes mom or dad would say, hey, Michael, I need you to take a moment, and I need you to take a deep breath, and I need you to be able to settle your body. And you know what Michael would say? I can't. I, I, I can't. But it turns out that almost everything that Michael would be asked to do, his answer would be, I can't. So the thing is, I can't is really closely related to another word uh, that Michael was learning and practicing. And there's even a verse in the Bible, well, there's not one about I can't that I'm not sure about. There's another one. His name was Michael. What his name could have been. I can. What do you think the difference might be if I tell myself in my brain, I can't do it? So he had spelling words. What do, you, do you think it would make a difference if he said, I can't, or if he said, I can? What difference would it make if Michael told himself in his brain, I can? It would make a difference of thinking well and thinking another thing. Totally. Who else? Yes. 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 So if Michael were to believe that he couldn't, turns out that when we think that we can't, much of the time we won't. And so the verse I think of is the one that comes from Philippians that says, I can't do all things. Is that what it says you think? I can't do all things through Christ. No. What do you think the verse says? I can. I can do all things through Christ. And so, boys and girls, as you go back uh, to your seats today, and because I don't have a mic, I'll go ahead and just do the prayer. I want you to remember that instead of being like Michael, who people call I can't, you could be Jewel, who people call I can remembering that through Christ we can do all things. And your task this week is if you're ready and your brain wants to say, I can't, I want you to tell your brain, no brain, not I can't, but what? I can. Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here in this place and for all these precious boys and girls, uh, your beautiful children, be with them in everything. Help them to remember that through Christ, uh, they can in all of their pursuits, for Christ's name's sake, amen. 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 Go on back to your seats, boys and girls. Thank you for coming up.
you're the teacher, but it's me, oh Lord. Not the pastor, nor the teacher, but it's me, oh Lord. the pastor, no the teacher, but it's me, oh Our scripture re reading for today is found in 2 Corinthians uh, 1, verse 2 to 4. Uh, we're going to read it in French and English. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of our comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. French. Um, give me a second. I have to use my phone. French, uh, it's uh, the same verse. It's 2 Corinthians, 1 les verset 2 à 4. Que la grâce et la paix vous soient données de la part de Dieu notre Père et du Seigneur Jésus-Christ. Béni soit Dieu, le Père de notre Seigneur Jésus-Christ, 
le Père des miséricordes et le Dieu de toute consolation, qui nous console dans toutes nos afflictions, afin que par la consolation dont nous sommes l'objet de la part de Dieu, nous puissions consoler ceux qui se trouvent dans quelques afflictions. May God bless the scriptures. Amen. It's a blessing that God can allow us to speak in tongues, right? Amen to that. It's a time of prayer. And uh, following the song, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in need of prayer. We definitely need to talk to him. On page 10 of your bulletin, you will find various uh, prayer requests. Uh, we do have some praises to We th continue to thank God for all those who were born in March. And uh, I believe we actually may have two that I know who were born on March 16. I believe Patrick is there. And I was just notified Garfield also is the birthday is today. And happy birthday to you too. We thank God for that. Uh, we praise God, Sister Carol Jennings, who had been undergoing a procedure. She actually felt well enough to be able to join us in first service this morning. So we thank God for that. And uh, we keep on praising God for Miriam Mills. But specifically on our prayer requests, we have a few more requests there that may be new. For Rose Bagrimbano, she is currently in hospital and we ask you to continue praying for her. For Debbie Mogadha also, it's an added prayer request that you may keep on praying for her as well. And please pay attention to the additional requests we have there on our prayer list. Take this list home when you have a moment to pray in your morning devotion or evening. Remember these names in prayer as well. At this time, I want to invite you, if you can, feel free to either kneel with me or bow your head as we approach God's throne. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing of being able to gather in your house of worship today. We thank you for sustaining us through the week. A Lord, also for our friends and family who are following online, we are still grateful for that privilege of being connected that together we can bow before you, call on your name, and trust you for the great things that we anticipate for the things you have already done. And Lord, also being conscious of our burdens and our concerns, that this day, Lord, we want to lay them before you. You have reminded us that if we, your people, are able to humble ourselves and pray. And Lord, we also confess that as human beings, we miss the mark. Many times we may have desires or thoughts that may lean in a different direction than how you want us to go. Lord, this morning we confess them to you too. Father, we also know that there are times that there are things you may call us to do, but we may choose not to. And even for this, Lord, we ask for your forgiveness, for your grace, and for your strength to be faithful. And so as a church family, as we gather to praise you for the things you have done in our lives, things we have spoken about and things we are yet to speak about, may it be known that you are still a faithful God to all of us. Father, I pray also for the request that we have for Sister Rose, who is in need of your healing mercies, for Sister Debbie, who is in need of your healing mercies, and Lord, many others who have been on our prayer lists, and other unspoken requests in our midst or at home. We just humbly submit ourselves to you. We commit this situation in your hands. 
believing that, Lord, in your hands, you do all things well. We are here, Lord, to continue receiving from you. Whatever we have already heard in the scriptures being read, the prayers offered, the music sung, may it find a place in our hearts. And even as we await to hear that which you have prepared your man's servant and Roger to share with us, open our hearts to hear your voice. And help us to trust you, knowing that even in this time, you are able to safeguard our hearts and minds by the peace of Jesus Christ. So we thank you not only for hearing this prayer, we also praise you for answering already, believing that in your hands we are well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. hablo inglés, así que es mi primer canto en este idioma para la honra de Dios, los que me entienden, sublime gracia. Amen. Yeah. 
Amen. Amen. Can we just acknowledge and affirm our sister Grace for that uh, song? Because I'm going to tell you what, if someone told me, I need you to get up here and sing a song to minister to these people in a language that you do not speak, I would tell them something. I would say, I thank you for the ask. I appreciate the request, but that's not going to happen. Uh, praise the Lord, because truly music is the heavenly language. Amen. And so uh, here we are again. It is our. I'm going to need someone to uh, help me, Hendrix, if you don't mind. Uh, some of you might remember if you've been coming here for a while, there was a while back when Pastor Elvis used to bring this thing up. Yes. And uh, and I figure today we're going to have a throwback. <laughs> We're going we're gonna to go back into the old days when uh, our pastor would uh, illustrate a few things right there on the screen. Uh, but I recognize that um, there is also uh, uh, those worshiping with us who are in their homes or other places where they are doing it virtually and they might not be able uh, to follow along. And so... Um, each of you should have received, and if you have not, there is a handout that will be going along with uh, today's message, and uh, hopefully for those on screen, uh, we'll project some of the responses, because not everyone's going to be able to see, and uh, well, my brother Billy, I receive anonymous feedback that my handwriting is not always clear to everyone, but I won't say who that feedback came from, I'm just looking for my friend brother Billy. All right, so <laughs> we're going to jump in. Uh, you might be aware that we've been having uh, a, an ongoing series uh, beginning uh, this current quarter around wellness in general, and this month we're um, highlighting um, mental wellness. And so uh, we started out with a video that you saw, uh, which is going to you know, um, tie into the message from today. But I just want to pause uh, for a moment. Um, to acknowledge God's presence and ask for his guidance. Father, we thank you so much for everything that you are. I'm also praising you for what you've done, dear God, and the fact that we're here today is a testament to your goodness. And at this moment, I'm going to ask that you um, remove self from me, dear God. As we enter into this word, I'm going to ask that the only voice that is heard in this place is the voice of Jesus. I'm going to ask, dear God, that the only movement that is felt is the movement of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to ask, dear God, that um, there is clarity that comes from your word and encouragement and hope. Receive this worship for Christ's name's sake. Amen. And I'm going to jump in. I'm going to let you know we're going to read a bit. I'm going to start over in the book of Jeremiah. And the reason I'm starting in the book of Jeremiah is because I'm, this title is called Mentally Well, and I wanted to begin by dispensing with this idea that I've heard in churches like ours, sometimes even uh, listening to 
you know, Sabbath school studies, etc. This idea that being a Christian somehow inoculates us from dealing with mental health concerns. I've heard this and I know that it's a belief that some have that once I am a Christian, once I'm in a relationship with God, that somehow should serve as a vaccine that prevents me from dealing with anxiety, that prevents me from going through depression, that prevents me from being mentally unwell. And I want to highlight that that message doesn't really seem to fit in the context of what we're going to read over here in the book of Jeremiah chapter 1. And so we're going to pick up in Jeremiah chapter 1. There are pews in the Bible in front of you. Everyone has potentially a phone uh, on, on, on your device, so you can follow along. Uh, if you never downloaded the Bible app, you could just do it in your browser. Uh, but I'm reading Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4, where it says this. The word of the Lord came to me, this is Jeremiah speaking, saying, Before I formed you, in the womb I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I anointed you as a prophet to the nations. And so what's happening is Jeremiah isn't saying, I have a thought or I have a belief or this is what I suspect. Jeremiah is saying, listen, God came to me and told me that before you were born, I set you apart for some great things. Amen. Jeremiah's response, of course, picking up in verse 6 is, ah, sovereign Lord, great Lord. He says, I don't know how to speak. I'm but a child. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a child. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them. For I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Verse 9, then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and to tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. And so without doubt, uh, Jeremiah is called, um, he's sanctified. And if we skip down to verse 18 and 19 of Jeremiah 1, uh, the word says this. God speaks to him and says, today I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they will not overcome you, for I am with you, and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. And so think about this promise. Think about the assurance. And if you're reading this story so far, you might say, okay, then if I'm going to call Jeremiah anything, maybe we should call him the exalted prophet, right? We should call him the special, the sanctified. Now, is Jeremiah known as the exalted prophet? Question number one, what is he known as? For those of you who don't know and you want to fill this out, Jeremiah is not considered the exalted prophet, despite what we just read. He's known as the weeping prophet. And why would someone who was set apart personally by God, why would someone uh, who God said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build you into a city, I'm going to set you up, and nobody who comes against you is going to prevail? Why would he be known as the weeping prophet? So to understand what's happening for, is for you to know that the book of Jeremiah also does not flow in a chronological order. Um, uh, the way that he writes the book, the way that things are put in, it actually is moving back and forth. So I'm going to jump over if this man who should be exalted by the time we get to Jeremiah chapter 15 and verse 10. Jeremiah is saying this, alas, my mother, that you gave me birth. A man with whom the whole land strives and contends. I've neither lent nor borrowed, yet everyone curses me. By verse chapter 15, Jeremiah is saying, Mom, why did you have me? He's saying, the way people treat me, people treat me like I owe them money, or they treat me like they owe me money. They don't treat me so, hey, you ever lent somebody a little something? And then hope to get that little something that you lend them back. And then after you lend them that little something, you realize that uh, their phone just goes to voicemail. They don't give you no eye contact when they see you. 
uh, uh, they, they divert their head, pretend like you don't exist. But, but wait, you, you, Jeremiah is saying, people are treating me like they owe me money. Or worse, like I owe them money. And he was ruining, regretting the day he was born. But I guess in Jeremiah's defense, uh, he had a tall order. He had a tall order. What God is saying to him, if you turn over with me to the book of Jeremiah chapter 16, in that first, first eight verses of Jeremiah 16, and I'm not going to read it straight, but I'll start, uh, and it says, Then the word of the Lord came to me and said, uh, You must not marry or have sons or daughters in this place. God is saying, the work that I have for you, it's going to require you uh, to live a solitary life. And if you keep reading, because there's a lot that we want to cover, God is saying, not only don't marry, don't have kids, but he's saying, you are going to watch your people die. This whole nation that you love, and they're not just going to die, they're going to die gruesome deaths. And when they die, you're going to see them laying and rotting on the ground because they're not even going to be buried. The birds are going to eat their corpses. If you in verse 5, uh, Jeremiah 16, he's saying you're not going to mourn for them. You're not going to bury them. You're not going to comfort their families. You're not going to console their loved ones. You're not even going to go to church and hold memorial services for them. Jeremiah was going through some things. And I suspect that Jeremiah isn't the only one who went through some things. As I was preparing, I, I was thinking about the other uh, characters in the Bible and uh, thinking about people like Saul, for example, King, who if he were alive today, and he went in to see a doctor, the doctor would probably listen to his story and say, Saul, um, I think the issue is that um, you have a bipolar disorder. You are suffering from manic depression. The thing is, Saul, like, sometimes you get in these depressed states and you don't want to do anything. You don't want to move. It seems like the only thing that soothes you really when you're locked in your depression is music seems to help you. You enjoy the harp. But when you leave your depression, you enter a manic phase. And in your manic phase... Uh, you become kind of wild, a little bit out of control. You become murderous, Saul. And, and, and then you obsess over certain things. You can't get those things out of your mind. And you, you, you're homicidal. And, and all of that feels like you're in a manic episode. But Jeremiah is going through some things. And we know that Jeremiah is going through some things because my man writes a whole book called Lamentations. And if you're thinking, well, what's a lamentation? A lamentation means I got some things to cry about. It means I got some things that I, I got to complain about because I'm going through some things. And, and, and I just want to uh, have you turn with me to the next book over if you're already in Jeremiah, the Lamentations chapter 3. And, and, and this is what it sounds like when the burden of what you're dealing with gets to you. And so next book over in Lamentations 3, listen to Jeremiah speak. He says, I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. Like God has been angry with me and he is afflicting me. Verse 2, he says, he has driven me away and made me walk in darkness rather than light. Indeed, he has turned his hand against me again and again all day long. He has made my skin and my flesh grow old. He has broken my bones. He has besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and hardship. He has made me dwell in darkness like those who are long dead. He has walled me in so that I cannot escape. He has weighed me down with chains. I am burdened. Even when I call out or cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. Jeremiah is going through some things. He's saying, I'm walking in darkness. All I'm experiencing is burden. It doesn't even matter that I seem to pray because he's, God's intentionally avoiding me at this point. Verse 9, he has barred my way with blocks of stone. He has made my paths crooked. Uh, 
he, like a bear lying in wait, like a lion in hiding, he dragged me from the path and mangled me and left me without help. He drew, he drew his bow and made me the target for his arrows. He pierced my heart with arrows from his quiver. I became the laughing stock of all my people. They mock me in song all day long. He has filled me with bitter herbs and sated me with gall. He has broken my teeth with gravel. He has trampled me in the dust. I have been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is. So I say my splendor is gone and all that I had hoped from the Lord. You don't write that unless you're going through some things. These kinds of thoughts don't come into your mind unless you've been through a few things. But Jeremiah is not the only one who went through some things. We're seeing scientists, researchers telling us that Americans' mental health is getting worse and worse. And if I'm here, number two, it's like, what are some of the things that cause our mental health dysfunction? I'm just going to go over them here. We got biology. That's the first answer. I don't need to write that because I've got him on the, I've got him on the board for you. Not everyone could read my writing. I'm going to save this for a little bit later. <clears throat> because the truth is, even sometimes when I'm not going through anything, uh, I've got things like DNA and genes, and there are things that pass down from family to family. And I might be struggling with anxiety right now, not because of things that have happened, but simply because my mom struggled with anxiety. Or my grandma or my grandpa struggled with anxiety, and it's been passed down. My depression might actually be a family heirloom. It might be something that was passed down from generation to generation. And for some of us, uh, what causes our mental health dysfunction is simply biology. For some of us, <laughs> we're stressed out. And so the American Psychological Association has been publishing for the past few years uh, a report called um, Stress in America in 2023. That Stress in America survey had a subtitle. Uh, it was subtitled, A Nation Recovering from Collective Trauma. And today is the 16th of March. It means that uh, exactly four years and three days ago, on March 13th, 2020, most of us got a message. You remember that message? Because if you had a student in school, the message sounded something like, hey, we're going to shut things down because there's this virus and we're hoping that we can have a shutdown for about two weeks. That should give enough time for it to clear the virus because we have confidence in Americans that they're going to socially distance and that they're going to take precautions to protect each other. So. We've got this team, about two weeks, if everyone is socially distancing, we should be okay. Four years and three years, uh, days later, we've lost almost 1,200,000 Americans. Researchers tell us that 200,000 children lost a caregiver since the start of the pandemic. 200,000 children lost either a parent or a grandparent or someone else who was their primary caregiver. And there's some things we could shake off, but I cannot shake off losing my loved one. I don't get to just wake up the next day and go, okay, shake it off. And so this last survey about stress in America, it says that we are recovering from collective trauma because we are still today dealing with the post-traumatic reactions uh, of this COVID pandemic. But when they ask, well, tell us about the things that you're stressed about. Who here could make a guess? What is the first, the number one thing that Americans report that they're stressed out about? Who said that? Money! Every single age, starting with adolescence, when they ask, what are you stressed about? Americans say, I am stressed about money. So they say, what's what I got? <laughs> I'm stressed also about how the economy is going. 
I'm stressed because rent is due, because the mortgage payment is coming up. I'm stressed because I got doctor's bills. Uh, the number one reported concern would be money. So if you're writing, uh, what are we stressed out about? We are stressed out about money. Uh, what else? What else stresses us out? I hear that. I hear that. Marriage, relationships, absolutely. So, so turns out the second, who said what? The second most commonly reported thing that Americans report is stressing out about is health. In lots of ways, but those two things interact with each other because uh, for some reason, I, for some people, I'm dealing with diabetes, I'm dealing with cholesterol, I'm dealing with heart, I'm dealing with cancer, I'm dealing with aging parents, and I've got to manage their health, I'm dealing with a child who has a chronic illness, I'm dealing with having to go to the doctor because they ran some tests and I don't know what the test said. Um, and so health is the second most commonly reported source of stress. But Americans also report that they're worried about like family responsibilities, all the things that I have to juggle. I'm worried about housing costs. I'm thinking we should sell our house, but if I sell my house, I'm going to have to buy another house. And you see the prices of homes these days, and you see the rates of interest on the mortgage. So we can't really sell because we can't afford uh, to move. And so uh, young people are like, I don't get paid enough uh, to purchase my own home, and I don't think that I'm going to be able to live the same kind of life. So we are stressed out about housing. Uh, we're stressed out about jobs. My boss, getting on my last nerve. Those coworkers, doing the best I can to tolerate them every day, but I'm on Monster.com, I'm on Indeed, I'm on Facebook Marketplace. I, I just need to find somewhere else to go to work. We're stressed out about relationships. This situation with my partner, with my spouse is stressing me out. We're stressed out about parenting. We're stressed out about dealing with the parents. But when we ask those questions, Americans are like, I'm also stressed out about this pandemic. I've got a compromised immune system. I can't just go out there like that. Or someone that I love is really susceptible to becoming sick. And so most of us could be unmasked, but someone in my home can't easily be unmasked. Stressed out about global conflicts, looking around the world right now, turning on the news with all the things that are happening, stressed out. Uh, Americans report that they're stressed out about racism, about racial injustice, stressed out about inflation. Lots of young people are reporting that we are really stressed out about this climate situation. We don't know if we're going to have a, a livable planet for ourselves. We are stressed. 24% of people reported that they now meet criteria for depression, and 23% of people report that they meet criteria for anxiety. And the interesting finding from the survey is that 67% of Americans say they don't feel comfortable talking about their stress. That's two-thirds of people when they get asked them. For a whole lot of reasons. Some people are saying, uh, I don't feel comfortable because I don't want to stress other people out with my, own, with my problems. You been there? There's some people who say, I don't feel too comfortable talking about it because I'm not even sure that talking helps. Some people are saying, I'm worried about what people are going to think about me if I start talking about what I'm going through, so I keep my mouth shut. But a lot of people also say, I don't talk because I don't have anyone to talk to. Because in addition to stress, we're dealing with loneliness, and that's going to be the next cause on your list if you're at number two. Uh, and you, we don't need... Uh, uh, hold on before you move on to uh, the slide there. Uh, what we see is uh, 2023, the Surgeon General um, uh, Vivek Murphy put out a uh, warning on the epidemic of loneliness uh, because scientists have found that on every continent, the whole world, people are just increasingly lonely. And that loneliness is not just emotional, that loneliness uh, is detrimental to our physical health because the more lonely I am, the more at risk I am for heart disease, for dementia, for stroke, and for premature death. That loneliness wears through our body and causes us to die younger. And so in uh, question Four, we're going to see this is a definition that comes from an author. Um, he's the director of Project on Lonely Initiative. 
and he defines it this way, that loneliness occurs when the connections a person needs in their life are greater than the connection needs that they have. In other words, when I have more needs to connect than I have people to connect with, I get lonely. And the thing about loneliness is, I could sit in a room of people and still be lonely. I could be lonely with people around me. And so Dr. Noble, he describes these three forms of loneliness. The first one he described is a psychological loneliness. And a psychological loneliness is exactly what I'm describing. It is, I just feel lonely. There might be people checking in, but I, I, have, I, I emotionally don't feel connected. I don't feel like I have someone to trust. I don't feel like I have someone to confide in. I don't feel like I have my person, and that leads me to feel lonely. But he also describes a social loneliness. And that social loneliness is, is when I feel excluded because um, I might be the only one like me in this group. And so that social loneliness might happen where, you know, I'm the only woman on this team and it's all men and it feels isolating to me. It might be uh, I'm the only person who shares this characteristic and I'm in a group where no one else shares it. And, and, and so people don't really understand what I go through. And, and I'm lonely because there's a, a part of who I am that is not shared by those around me. And, I, and, and when, even when I'm with people, I feel isolated. And then he describes an existential loneliness, and that's feeling just disconnected from myself. Um, and if you know that, I work with young people as a psychologist, and I have a lot of young people increasingly coming, describing a phenomenon that we call depersonalization. And what depersonalization is, it is like, it's almost as if I'm just going through the motions of life, but I don't feel connected to my body. I'm like wa watching myself living, but I don't feel like I'm integrated or connected. I really feel disconnected from myself and disconnected from the world. And so although loneliness, uh, the reports peaked in 2020, we're still reporting much higher levels of loneliness now than we were uh, reporting below. And uh, younger people, one of the fascinating things that we learn is that the more time I spend on social media, the more lonely I become. And it's a fascinating thing because social media does something. It, it, it's, a, it's a dopamine rush when I post and I wait for people to like things and heart things and make comments. Uh, it's actually very uh, rewarding to me to receive those likes, but the more time I spend, the more I'm disconnected from people and from genuine human to human connection and so the longer I'm in my social media account, the more lonely I feel. So we're dealing with loneliness. We're dealing with stress. We're dealing with our biology and then we're gonna go backwards. What else are we dealing? We're dealing with trauma. And trauma, uh, it's defined this way. It is the emotional response to terrible events. And so if you are in question number six, it's the emotional response to terrible events. These events are often serious and they're unwanted and they overwhelm our ability to cope. Think about the things that we go through that meet the criteria for trauma. Serious, unwanted, often it's unexpected and it overwhelms our ability to cope. And so if you're number two trying to go, what was C? C is trauma. I'm sorry, D is trauma. B was stress, C was loneliness. And it's not just trauma. There's a bonus category, and I know there was no E, and you're like, well, you don't have E, why wouldn't you put E? Because when we look into trauma, we also see um, what we're gonna call uh, Demons. That's too small. It's just demons. And by demons, what I mean is that researchers have noticed this thing in America over the past decade or more. Uh, when we think about what are the causes of death in America, the things that contribute to death more than anything else, the biggest contributors to increased death, not counting COVID, uh, would be what scientists refer to as deaths of despair. 
And these are deaths from people who are battling all kinds of personal demons. And the deaths of despair, uh, suicide, substance, overdose from all of the substances, primarily opiates, amphetamines, cocaine, and alcohol. And then cardiovascular disease that is second or secondary to obesity. And when we look at why, what are some of the causes of death, they've noticed over the last decade or more that these deaths of despair have significantly increased. In 2022, the last time we hit data, we found something in America that we had never seen before, ever in our history. And it was this, for young children, 10 through 24, firearms became the leading cause of death. For young people, age 10 through 24, for the first time in our history, firearm death, both intentional and unintentional. And all of these things are traumatizing to loved ones, to family members, and often the result of demons that we're battling. And it's interesting because as I was preparing for this, I, I, I found out uh, there were multiple occasions, but there are at least 12 specific times when uh, uh, Jesus is recorded to, to be casting out demons as part of his ministry. And if these people were around here today, they wouldn't go to a doctor and the doctor wouldn't diagnose them with demons. But we're still dealing with it. And so if we're wondering, uh, how do these things, biology, stress, loneliness, trauma, and their demons impact our mental health? We have to think this way. <clears throat> Every moment, Every moment, I'm being influenced by my past, by my present, and by my future. And this matters a lot because here in this moment, I might be focusing on something that happened in the past. You know, so think about like those memories that I have about the past or uh, some of the beliefs that I have about things. So I might be here this week, but I might be thinking, you know what, last week when I came to church, I saw Sister Sharon, and usually she looks at me and smiles and says, Happy Sabbath, but that week, uh, she didn't even look at me. She said nothing to me. Uh, 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 I, I was offended, I was hurt, and now I'm feeling a certain kind of way, and I'm, I got some thoughts in my mind about why it is that she had the nerve to pass me like I don't exist last week. And so today, I'm being influenced by that past. And it might influence the way I treat my sister Sharon because I'm holding on to that thing. How dare you? You know you saw me. But in every moment, we are influenced by our past. We are influenced by our present. Like right now, I don't feel comfortable around her. And I'm also influenced by my future. And the, 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 the way that I'm going to describe it is this way. And forgive me, um, art has never been my thing. What is this? Yes, thank you. Thank you, friends. That is supposed to be a bottle. Because, <laughs> wait, who's laughing at me? <laughs> It's a bottle. <laughs> you know, I was hoping for some kindness and grace when I got up here today. And so, here's the... <laughs> Sister Sharon is going to make up for her. <laughs> she, can't, she can't tolerate it. <laughs> <laughs> I 
she, she's making up. <laughs> she's making up, I guess, you know. <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. And so I want you to think of yourself as a bottle. Think of yourself as a vessel. Because uh, number eight says, while we don't store events in our bodies, we do something. What we carry are the thoughts and the feelings about the things that we've been through in our past. That is what we hold. That is what we carry. Uh, I, I'm not reliving that experience every week, but I'm holding on to the thoughts and the feelings. And I want to let you know that I'm, this is very much a simplified version of what happens because in reality, I have thoughts, I have feelings, and I have some feelings about my thoughts. Because I, I know why she did that. I got some feelings. And I got some thoughts about my feelings. And I have some thoughts about the thoughts about my feelings. And some feelings about the feelings about my thoughts. And so this is actually really complicated how I get in my head. And some of us are able to flexibly live in the present. But there are those of us who cannot live in the present because we're stuck. Thinking. And re-experiencing those feelings that we experienced in the past. And at every moment, number eight, you, we carry these thoughts and the feelings related to, into our body. And, and, and the feelings about the thoughts and the thoughts about the feelings. And every experience that I have is going in and it's holding in my vessel. And as I go through, I'm having experience right now. I'm even having uh, thoughts about the future. Worries. Mortgages come and due. Got to go to the doctor to get those results. Uh, I don't know what's going on with my child. They're not really on that path that I hope that they would be on. So in this moment, I might also be in the future and I can't even be present because of my worries about the future. And when these thoughts and these feelings fill or bottle up, uh, church, we were not designed to hold all of this inside. We need a way to be able to release because when I have no release, then I get, I get here. And then I've had my fill. And when I have my fill, then I can't take it anymore. The more I'm holding on to these things, the less I'm able to deal with new things. And then I have three choices. This is it. As a human, I am limited. I can talk about what I'm going through. I can take some actions. I can act in ways that are helpful are unhelpful or I could bottle it. I could keep it inside. Say, give it to Jesus. Uh, and that's why I start with Jeremiah because sometimes we say, just give it to Jesus, but give it to Jesus doesn't mean that I'm not still holding all these things in my body that is making me susceptible to anxiety and depression. And yes, we're going to talk about how we, we, we can depend on Jesus, but it does not mean that I'm not susceptible. And there's some of us who like, I'm not going to talk about it. Some of us, we're going to act. And so, you know, when I say act, we can act in ways that are helpful or unhelpful. Uh, for example, you know, um, I'm still stewing about what happened between me and Sister Sharon last week. And so Brother Hendricks comes up and say, hey, uh, Brother Roger, do you think that you can help me with? And I'm like, help you? I have nobody. And it's like, well, why are you treating me this way? And it turns out that because I, I'm holding stuff, I'm acting out to my brother right here. Now he's going to go home and punch the wall. And, and his wife at home taking care of a sick child, like, why are you punching the wall? Because he's not acting out because I made him feel a certain kind of way. But it doesn't mean that all actions are unhelpful. I could also do things like, I'm going to take an extra long run today. I need to get that out. Uh, I'm going to write in my journal and release some of these things. Uh, I'm going to, uh, so I could act in ways that are helpful or I could bottle it. But the thing about bottling it is that I, when I bottle it, uh, happy, too blessed to be stressed. I'm blessed by the best. How you doing, my brother? excellent. You're not excellent. You know you're struggling. You know you're going through some things. You're just bottling it. 
And when we bottle it, two things are going to happen. One, I'm going to break. Or two, I'm going to blow. When I say break, what I mean is that my body is going to say, I cannot take this anymore. It's going to become symptomatic. I'm going to have headaches. I'm going to have neck pains. I'm going to have stomach aches. I'm going to have GI issues like diarrhea and constipation. I'm going to have insomnia. I'm going to have all kinds of things go bad with my body because I'm keeping all of these things inside in an attempt to bottle it and pretend like everything is okay. And so how do our thoughts impact our mental health? Proverbs 18.21 says, the tongue has the power of life and death. Those who love it will eat its fruit. The MSG version says, words kill and words give life. They're either poison or fruit. You choose. And so we end up having internal conversations about ourselves, to ourselves. We talk to ourselves. And I start telling myself, I generate some beliefs from the past. I bring those into the present about Sister Sharon. She's fake. call herself a Christian, <laughs> kind of Christian, come to church, say about happy Sabbath, praise the Lord, but does that to someone else. <laughs> I'm generating some beliefs. Those thoughts that I hold are powerful. And scientists who are studying mental habits, uh, they find something. I'm just going to leave that there because I don't need to write it. I don't need to write it. They find that um, uh, this is the work of um, Aaron Beck, for example. He, he found that there is what's called a depressive triad, and the depressive triad uh, is the way that I start to think about myself, the way that I start to think about others, and the way that I start to think about my future. And the depressive triad refers to these persistent negative thoughts about myself, I start thinking I'm all of the negative things. I become so self-critical, I'm fat. I don't think anyone's gonna love me. I think I'm gonna be alone my whole life. Uh, I feel inadequate, I feel worthless. I believe I'm unlovable. I just think I'm bad at things, I'm incompetent. I'm not a good daughter, I'm not a good friend, I'm not a good mother. I'm not a good husband, I'm not a good wife. I develop persistent negative thoughts about myself, but also about others. And I start thinking that you know, people are harsh. They're critical, they're uncaring, they're unloving, they're unreliable, I can't count on these people. Am I gonna go talk to someone who I can't count on? Of course not. And that depressive triad also includes negative thoughts about my future where I just say, well, that's just the way it is. That's the reality. Just got to deal with it. And I develop a sense of hopelessness, like this isn't going to change. And so I get stuck in a cycle of pessimism. <clears throat> because of the negative ways that I think about myself, the way that I'm self-critical, the way that I never see good things about myself, I really focus on my flaws, I focus on my failures. And that makes me prone to depression. But then there are also some habits, some things that I'm doing in my hand that create anxiety. And those anxious habits, if we're in 11, include uh, some negative predictions about the future. And what I'm talking about are actually not intentional thoughts. I'm talking about a habitual way that my brain sets itself on autopilot, often without my recognition. And so I wake up at three o'clock in the morning, go, I don't think I closed the door. I think I left the door open and all of the windows. What if someone breaks into the house? I gotta get out of bed. I'm on the highway heading to work. I'm like, uh, did I turn the stove off this morning? I made breakfast, but I don't think I turned the stove off. Oh man, I feel like I did leave the stove on. Uh, I've got this thing I notice on my skin. Um, what if it's brain cancer? 
You never know. <laughs> but these negative predictions, the way that when I think about the future, I imagine catastrophe. I imagine negative things are going to happen. And I'm also ex over-exaggerating negative events. Let me tell you what that means. Uh, so I work with young people. I already said that. And sometimes a young person will come in and they'll sit and they'll say something like this. I had the worst day of my life. The worst day of your life? Today? Yeah. Well, how many worst days of your life have you had this week? Well, yesterday was also the worst day of my life. <laughs> well, will you tell me a little bit more about, well, I was walking in the hallway, my backpack opened, my books fell out on the floor, and the whole school was laughing at me. I can't go back there. The whole school? Everybody was laughing at me. Let's count, if you will, just Humor me. How many humans were in the hall? Three. <laughs> but in my mind, a setback, a difficult situation that I went through, something that didn't work out the way I wanted to, my brain has made it much bigger, much more upsetting. And then I combine that with another thing of I underestimate or I discount my ability to cope with a stressful situation and someone says, hey, my brother, would you like to go up and read the scripture this Sabbath? I'm like, there's no way I can <laughs> climb those three steps and get in front of people here. Are you mad? I would faint. <laughs> Underestimating my ability to cope. I have, I have uh, something going on. Remember I talked to the kids about I can't? Listen to the children's story. But I have this thing in my mind that is constantly discounting my ability to manage stress. I'm telling myself, I can't do it. It's going to be too much. It's going to be overwhelming. There's no way. And I'm combining all of these mental habits while I'm imagining catastrophe. If negative things happen, I'm blowing them out of proportion. And I'm telling myself, I can't cope. And it gets fatiguing. And I want to be really mindful now as I'm going to the end that... Uh, I am not giving you tools today to go diagnosing your partner, your spouse, your family, your friend. Uh, this is not what this is about. This is about enlightenment. This is about increasing my own understanding of why the things that we go through create uh, mental health dysfunction. I am not weaponizing you to go around diagnosing people. All right? This is about insight. But you might be asking, uh, what if this is me? All right? We know that our mental functioning affects not just our emotions. So number 12, our mental, uh, it affects our bodies, our brains, our behavior. I call those our three Bs. And it affects our feelings. And so um, all the things that I'm dealing with in my past and my present, they affect my body. I feel my heart pounding. I'm likely to have a panic attack. Uh, I'm out of breath. Uh, I'm tired all the time. Uh, I don't really feel comfortable uh, in my skin right now. They affect my brain. I'm generating a lot of negative thoughts about people and about myself. It affects my behavior. Uh, we know that both depression and anxiety can lead to uh, avoidance and procrastination. And so because I'm stressed out, I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it later. And because I don't do it now, then later I got a mountain. And then I'm discounting my ability to cope. I can't do it. And so when I'm procrastinating and putting things off and avoiding, then the symptoms are increasing. And so if I want to heal, as we go to 13, we know that mental healing is going to involve a few things. The first thing it's going to involve is acknowledging and accepting our feelings. And church, I want to really highlight this because, again, we've all been socialized to be dishonest about feelings. We've all been socialized. How are you today? What do you say? Good. Fine. Good. That's our socialization. We've been trained to not acknowledge that. I'm going through some things. We've been socialized to not even accept our feelings. And when we don't accept it, there's really nothing that we can do about it because we cannot take action for some things that we don't accept. Mental healing involves recognizing and changing unhelpful behavior habits. Because I got some thoughts about, she thinks she's going to ignore me? 
I got something for her. I'm going to step on her toes accidentally. (laughs) Part of that healing involves recognizing and changing some unhelpful behavior habits. I realize that uh, because I feel irritable, uh, I tend to go off on people. I realize that because I feel depressed, there's a script in my head that says, don't bother, don't do it today. And so even getting up out of bed feels like it's too much because I have this thing like, "Eh, you can't, you don't have any energy for that. Healing involves recognizing and changing some unhelpful mental habits. It means that I gotta get really good at thinking about my thinking, thinking about how I am both perceiving and explaining other people's behavior to myself. And then it involves uh, being present in my body and caring for my body. And we have a beautiful message about ways that we can care for our bodies. So let's go to the last thing. If I want to improve my own mental functioning, it really... I now have to think about the past, the present, and the future because all of those affect my mental health functioning. And so if I want to be whole, I've got to focus a little bit on the past and I've got to think about how can I connect to positive emotions because the thing is, I've had lots of emotions in my life, but when I deal with anxiety and depression, I filter things and so my memory doesn't remember everything. It really only tends to remember the negative things even though I have access to lots of different memories. And so uh, I could overcome or improve by learning how to connect to positive emotions, uh, how to recall joy, how to think about times instead of only thinking about the times when I felt offended, when I felt hurt, when I felt discouraged, when I felt ignored, when I felt left out, but to think about and recall joy. There's a lot of research, and this is not even coming from the Bible, but it could be everything here. But this is actually coming from science that says practicing forgiveness. When I think back in the past, so I can go, you know, Sister Sharon, I could hold this for the next 50 years, and you think people don't do that? You don't, you haven't met church folk. (laughs) (laughs) Or I could practice forgiveness. And forgiveness is a letting go of my right to revenge. It's not saying that I wasn't harmed or hurt. It's saying that I'm going to release this right that I have to pay you back. And I'm also practicing letting go of bitterness and resentment. Um, And finally, um, how to make peace with my past. And then in the present, if I want to improve my mental health functioning, I've got to think about how do I practice mindfulness And that video that you saw at the beginning of service actually talked a little bit about mindfulness. Bring myself in the moment because some of us are simply stuck in the past. I cannot have joy in this moment because I had pain in the past. I cannot have peace today because I had distress in the past. And some of that calls for me to practice mindfulness And a a thing that is called temporariness. Let me tell you what temporariness is. My brain starts to say that some things are permanent. My brain starts to uh, make permanent what happened uh, with Sister Sharon last week. My brain says she's a fake Christian. And it labels her and restricts who she is. And I make that just who she is, and that is permanent. Temporariness allows me to say, You know what? I wonder if she was feeling sick last week. I wonder if she was having her own personal struggle that I might need to go check in with her and say, hey, you need a hug, you need a prayer, you need something. Temporariness also can apply to my own emotions so that when I'm going through it, I can remind myself that this thing that I'm feeling is not forever. And what else is temporary? What else is temporary? all of this because this world is not our home and so scientists are telling us that we could practice temporariness reminding ourselves that this is not forever reminding myself that I I don't need to lock someone into an identity in my own head 
I could describe it as something that I could have been situational and still open up grace that allows me to forgive. And then the practice of gratitude. And this is coming again. This is not even the word. This is what science is saying. How different is this from the word? I'm going to show you why it's not different. That's how we're going to close. And then fostering connection. Because the thing is, uh, if I, the degree, the more I'm disconnected, the more I spend in my head. And those are my choices. I could be connected with people or I could be connected with those thoughts swirling in my head about the past, about what I'm going through right now, and about those worries that I have for the future. And connecting with people is powerful because it allows us to get out of our heads. And then in the future, it's about positive anticipation. I've got some things that I'm looking forward to. It's about hopefulness. It's about optimism. And I'm wondering because there's some of you here right now who probably haven't had an optimistic thought in quite a while. And an optimistic thought would be a thought that sounds like, you know, this is going to work out. An optimistic thought is a thought that says, you know what, my marriage, it's going to get better. An optimistic thought is a thought that says, this thing that I'm going through is only for this moment, and I'm in a season, but this is not all the season. Seasons change, and I've got something better to look forward to. That is optimism. And so last thing, I'm going to turn over back to Lamentations, because I want to show you what Jeremiah, you remember what I read? You remember how he was lamenting? That very same chapter. Turn to verse 22. Last thing we're doing today. Jeremiah says this. 3 and verse 22. And I want to show you what he does with the past, the present, and the future. After lamenting, he says this. Because of the Lord's great love, we're not consumed. Jeremiah says, you know what? Let me just take a moment and think about what God brought me through. Let me just take a moment and think about God's faithfulness and the fact that I'm even alive to be complaining the way that I'm complaining today. He says, it's because of his great love we're not consumed. For his compassion, they never fail. They're new every morning. He says, great is your faithfulness. He's like, yesterday when I experienced you, you are faithful, and that means that today when I wake up in the morning, I could count on you being faithful, and even though I get lost in my thoughts, I know that tomorrow, great is your faithfulness. He says, I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore, I will wait for him. To the one who seeks him, it is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. See, sometimes when we've been through some things, it's hard for us to have peace and patience. And Jeremiah went through some things, but you know what? It's really good for me to practice some patience. God is going to come through. For some of us, healing is going to require following some of these tips, or some of us, healing is going to require getting ourselves a therapist, a counselor, a psychologist. For some of us, Healing is going to require even more. We might need to talk to our doctor about medicine because truly uh, we have sunk. We are so full. Um, we carry so much uh, that medicine is going to be a part of the thing that actually gives us some release and allows us some breathing room to start coping and dealing with things again. So I don't want to hear that because we're Christian. We can't go through some stuff. Jeremiah went through some things. But as Christians, we have something that some people don't, that we can use when we're going through some things. Father, thank you so much for the time that we've been able to spend here. Thank you, dear God, for who you are, for those promises. Great is your faithfulness, and you renew it to us on a daily basis, dear God. And for everyone that's struggling with their mental health, I'm going to commit them to you, dear God, to give them peace, to bring them healing, to give them light where there is darkness, dear God. Thank you so much for hearing us when we pray for Christ's name's sake. Amen. 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 And I believe uh, our praise team is going to come up. We're going to sing the first and the last only from our closing hymn, uh, which is 511. We're going to do the first and the last verses.
Please be seated. Worshiping giving. We invite the deacons to come forward, please. And uh, we're going to read a verse in Malachi 3, verse 10. Um, we're waiting for the deacons to come forward. Okay. Um, we're going to read Malachi 3, verse 10. It says, Okay. Give me a second. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, and there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. So this is the word that uh, God, this is the words of God for us to be faithful in our tithe and offering. So we have uh, different ways we can, uh, we can provide that. If we uh, take a look, we can go to the advantagegiving.org website uh, to give your tithes and offerings. Or you can mail your tithes and offerings uh, to West Wilmington SDA Church, which is 3003 Mill Creek Road, Wilmington, Delaware. Or you can drop it off uh, at the box uh, outside of the church. Uh, in those corners, you can drop your tithes and offerings there. And uh, to allow the deacons to get uh, to get the tithes and offerings, we I believe we have a, a special, a song special. Let's hear that. Amen.
right, so how many of you enjoyed the service today? You know, as I was listening to Dr. Wadra speaking, one thing that came to mind, I feel like us coming to church, I think church, coming to church is one of the most underrated thing because we have the chance to learn a lot without a pen. We learn a lot of good things from different speakers or pastors or um, special guests, our own Dr. Roger and many others, where we learn a lot of things that would require us to go to school or you know, go to seminar, whatever, just to pay money to learn those things. But we get them here. And we thank God for that. God uh, uses servants to get the words out where we can learn a lot and help us better individuals. Now, we're going to uh, read the benedic benedictory um, to close uh, the service. And it is found in Philippians 4, verse, verses 6 to 8. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Um, I hope you guys have a wonderful day, a wonderful Sabbath day. Make the most out of it. Um, we have a, some of us uh, might have to do some visits, to visit some other, you know, other people who didn't make it to church today, or um, the any anybody um, that needs help or assistance, some kind of way. This is our chance to visit them and tell them about Jesus, about the good day you you had. The, the, the message you heard, this is our chance to expand the word of God to others. And in return, we get the blessing of Jesus Christ. Have a wonderful day and happy Sabbath. Amen. Happy Sabbath, church. This is for a message for many melodies. Uh, we have our kids' children choir. We're rehearsing in the room to my left, your right, the first room, and also adventurers, we will be meeting for our service project in this room. So adventurers, you'll be in many melodies for 15 minutes because we have to rush over to do our service project. There is adventurers this afternoon, we have class, and also adventurers next Sabbath, we have class next Sabbath, and please bring all our adventurers because we'll be rehearsing for Adventure Sabbath in April. So have a great day. I think there's potluck for everyone so everyone can join. Have a happy Sabbath. <laughs>